Good evening, War Hill. Come on, let's give God praise. Come on, let's give him praise. We're talking about the King of Kings. He's worthy. Let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord. We don't have to wait for a song to praise God. Amen. He's worthy. He's worthy. You ever stop for a moment and just think about how good he is? We're ready to press in, but I think it's befitting to just stop for a minute. If any of you work or do as much as I do, sometimes you need to stop for a second and just praise him. Cut out all the noise, all the extra sounds. Think of his goodness. We don't normally do this, but I, I think it's time that we do this right now. That we stop for a moment to just hear the Lord. Lord, we submit ourselves to you and we surrender to your way. This is Easter week, Resurrection week. And our Lord Jesus went in that tomb alone. They rolled that stone and he was alone. He was alone in his flesh, but the Father was right there. So when you feel alone, when you think no one's there, the Father is right there. When you've been beat up all week, when you've been talked about, the Father's right there. He didn't leave his son and he didn't leave us. So, Father, we acknowledge your goodness for being a comforter, for always making a way out of no way. Remind us of who you are and what kind of a father you are. A loving, kind, merciful, just king. Lord, we thank you for this time that we take with you right now. We decrease so you may increase. In our weaknesses, Lord, be our strength. Have your way in this place. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we give God praise tonight? Come on, he's worthy. Come on. We need those quiet moments, amen? Come on, let's praise the Lord. Feel free to get out of your aisle. Come on, let's praise. I was buried beneath Come on. my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my
rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was in orphan now you called me a sinner, sin of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the end and I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open Keep giving, keep providing. I 
Come on, he's sweet, amen.
somebody's waiting for something you're waiting for a sign this is it right here someone just at least one someone said lord speak to me if it's for me let me know this is it right here 
presence is where we get out of the way and we make room for the Lord. the earth began to shake and the 
begins to fall off. Can you feel it falling off tonight? It's cause we come to that place of rest where we properly belong, sitting before the king, looking up and saying, God, I trust in you. I trust in you. We belong in that proper place of worship. Today I was thinking about the five blessings Y'all remember those? Church, you remember those that pastor was having us praying? Pray that you would bless our emotions. I pray, God, that you would bless our relationships. Pray, God, that you would bless our children. Amen and amen. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our finances. Amen, amen, amen. And I pray, God, that you would bless the purpose and the call that you have on our life. I was sitting in worship today, and it's been kind of heavy this week, and it gets kind of heavy when you're trying to do it on your own, amen? And I got in worship, and I started just singing and praising God, and then those five blessings that pastors led us to pray, I've been praying those lately. Again, I pray them over my children, but I felt distinctly led to pray those today. And as I was praying them, the Holy Spirit changed when I was praying he said how can I bless it if you don't trust me with it and so I began to pray God I trust you with my relationships God I trust you with my emotions God I, I trust you with my children I trust you with my finances and God this call this purpose whatever it may be I trust you with it anybody in here tonight need to turn it over to God and let it and trust him Let's put our hands to the Lord. I want to pray tonight. Can we pray tonight? The Lord just literally laid this psalm on my heart. Psalm 79, 8. I'm going to read a portion of it. And he's crying out to the Lord for, to save it, to help it. And he says, forgive us. But this is what he says. Let your compassion quickly meet our needs for we are on the brink of despair. God, with our hands raised tonight, there are things going on in our life that we don't have control over. God, there are things going on in our life that we do have control over. There are things going on in our life, Lord, that, that seem to be spiraling. Sometimes we don't understand why things are happening, Lord, but we're not trusting in our own ability. We're not trusting in who, what we can do and what we can't do. We're not even trusting in our own ability to go make the money that we need. We're trusting in you to provide it. So Father, with our hands raised tonight, we just simply say we trust you, God. We trust you, Lord. Everybody praying together. Father, we trust you, Lord. We need you and we want more of you. And we need more of your spirit in our lives. God, that thing that's going on in those relationships, Lord, we give them to you. That thing that's going on in our children, Lord, we give them to you. Lord, that thing that's going on in, in the hope and the dream that seems to have died, Lord, we give that to you tonight. And Lord, we're asking you to move in it. We put it back in your hands where it belongs. And we stand where we belong, looking up at the King of Kings and saying, you are God. All hell, King Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We trust in you, Lord. We know that you're going to do it. We thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. I think that, that moves right into our giving. We'll go ahead and bring the ushers down. But that moves right into our giving. I know that there are people in here that, that need the Lord to do something special in their finances. And this is not me talking to you solely about giving here tonight at this church in this time. But it is to challenge you. If you need the Lord to move in your finances, where are you at in your finances? 
Where are you at in your giving? Where are you at in your sowing? The Bible says that we will reap what we sow. If we sow to that good and spiritual, it will come back. And if you think about it tonight, wherever you may be, I want you to think about it. If you have a financial need, where are you at with your finances? And as we pray over this offering, I'm going to pray for your finances. We're going to pray for the finances of this house. And we're going to pray that God moves mightily. In, in the book of Acts, it said that they all came together and they gave everything that they owned and that became one of another's, right? And as I was reading that a couple weeks ago, what the Lord spoke to me was this, and this is what I've been praying in my own life. I want my money to mean something. And the Lord said, the reason that I moved so mightily because there was fire in their finances. There was a holy fire that came upon them at Pentecost, but it also moved when they all came together and gave properly in which they needed. My prayer is that there will be a fire in our finances. There will be a fire in our finances. There will be a fire in our finances. And it would move in the way God wants it to move. Amen? So I want y'all to pray that with me tonight before we transition, okay? Uh, one final thing before we pray. Don't forget, we've got uh, Good Friday service, 7 p.m. So we're looking forward to that. I saw the team really working hard on that this week. They've been pouring in, getting it ready for you guys. Uh, we got an amazing team, amen? Somebody give them a hand. And before we move, let's recognize the worship team again. Give them a hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we have. And sometimes, God, we thank you. Many times we thank you for what we don't have because we know we deserve far more than that. And, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, us all together in this place, in this building, as your church, Lord, you've given us a portion, and you've given us a portion to sow. And there's many needs in this house there's many needs of the house, and there's many needs of the individuals in their own houses. And I'm asking you, Lord, this year, God, create a fire in our finances. Create a fire that makes our finances effective in the kingdom of God. Lord, bless it now. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Get out and greet each other. Say hello. Give each other a hug. God. I do want to say before we introduce our speaker tonight, I want to say if you're a guest in here tonight, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you being here. And um, we got a we got a fine pastor in the house tonight, right? Amen. Amen. Many of y'all have heard Pastor Stephen preach here. Uh, he comes from our Claremont campus. Uh, Canton campus, sorry. Thank you. That, that was a quick response. I knew what I was saying. I just said it wrong. She was like, uh uh. It was like you saw that happening. Canton campus, how long you been over there now? Over a year, right? Just over a year. Just over a year. God's doing big things over there, isn't he? Amen. 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 He's been preaching on, I don't want to take his sermon tonight, but he's been preaching on, I've been hearing him preach on rest. 
rest in the kingdom of God. So I'm sure he's going to bring something related to that tonight. Hopefully, maybe, I don't know. But uh, we're grateful to have him. Let's give him, let's give him a round of applause as he comes up. Amen. We got any walking testimonies in the house tonight? We got anybody in the house that love Jesus? Is your life a walking testimony of what he's done in your life? Can I, can I give it up for Pastor Rick? If I may, I'm going to be honest. I don't know him that well. And I don't like that I don't know him that well because I was getting brother from another mother vibes from <laughs> Pastor Rick. We need to hang out, brother. I, 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 th- I bet you enjoy it because I know I would. You carry my passion. Come on. He carries my passion. Um, what a privilege and an honor it is to be here tonight. It always is. This is beginning to feel like family to me. Uh, my extended family over in Dawsonville. Uh, I know that he just introduced me, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am Pastor Stephen Pierce coming from the Canton campus. Where is Canton campus? They want to be quiet. They don't want me to be quiet, but they want to be quiet. I think every one of them sitting over here is like, you give it to them tonight, Pastor. You go give it to them. I don't know what that means. I don't Maybe they, I guess I've been stepping on their toes, so they want me to come get on yours. That ain't true, is it? That ain't true. Come on, we preach the good news. It it really is an honor and a privilege to be here. Before I get started tonight, let me ask a question. Do I have any ladies in the house who love Jesus? Come on. I'm talking to the women. Any any women in in the house that go, I'm just on fire and happy about what God's doing in my life? Good. Can I give you a personal invitation we have a ladies' gathering, a ladies' conference coming up that we are hosting at the Canton campus, and we would be honored if you would come be a part of it. I know that you are going to be blessed by it. April the 13th, we have uh, Miss Alyssa Holt coming all the way from Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm telling you, if you come and sit under her ministry, let her minister to you, you are going to leave blessed and encouraged and empowered. All you got to do is go on there and register, $25 to register, and I'm telling you, you're going to get a blessing from it. Amen? Well, that was a little weak, but I'll say it for you. Amen! I believe you will. This is April 13th. I believe it begins at 10.30 a.m., so if you are a lady and you want to come participate, by all means, we would love to have you. Amen. Uh, Before I get going tonight, something that you've probably seen me do a lot because I really believe in it, is can I honor our, our pastor? Can I recognize Pastor Don Allen, our bishop? Uh, I don't know if he's getting to watch tonight or not, but I want you to know that I love you dearly. I want you to know that my entire family loves Pastor Don Allen. I'm going to tell you right now. My children just love Pastor Don Allen. That man, I'm telling you, I don't know how he got into the hearts of my children the way he has, but they just, they love him. And I love him too, and I know that you do. Don't we love our pastor and our bishop? Amen. Amen. He has been nothing short of a blessing to my entire family, and I'm just grateful to know him. Uh, Could we do something? You know, one thing I can say about War Hill, Dawsonville, it's never been quiet, but it is tonight, isn't it? It's all right. I'm going to preach anyway because I don't need your support. (laughs) But I would like for us to, to cover him in prayer. Could we cover our pastor in prayer together? And believe, how many of you believe God's a healer? Not just a healer, but he is the healer. Do you believe that he is the healer? If you do, would you uh, release faith and let's cover him in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you so much right now, God. I'm asking that you would touch our pastor. Lord, right where he stands, right where he sits, God, I'm asking for a divine intervention of the Holy Ghost to intervene into his life. Lord, we speak to his body right now by the authority that's been given to us by the power of the Holy Ghost in this 
new covenant and I speak to his body and I tell you to come into alignment of the finished work of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus into his body and I tell you that you are healed. We call you whole and we call you well and it is so and it is done and we declare that that thing is finished in the powerful name of Jesus and everybody in the church shouted amen. If you believe he's healed, you ought to put your hands together. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't wait to hear that testimony. Amen. Amen. Can I go ahead and jump in the word tonight? I always stretch for time. Y'all going to be blessed tonight. I told my wife on the way over here, I said, I think I got about 15 or 20 minutes worth. And she said, you say that every time. Amen. I don't know where Pastor Jeff Browning is, but he's laughing at me. There he is. Every time I say, I'm going to be 20 minutes, he literally laughs out loud. (laughs) Come on, but I get passionate about the word because God has just been so good. I could go on and on about what God's doing in Canton, but I'm going to be honest. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. I don't want to spend any time talking about Canton. It's a blessing. We're seeing miracles. We're seeing salvations, and that's great. But I came to preach Jesus tonight because I believe he'll do the same thing here tonight. I don't believe in doing church as usual. I didn't come here for just a Wednesday night gathering just because it was a cute, holy thing to do. Oh, it's quiet already. Good. I like it. I'm going to preach right through it. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. If you have an iPhone or an Android or a Bible, whatever you have, I want you to join with me and read these scriptures. Before we do, would you do me a favor? Because I feel a little tense. Would you look over at a neighbor and tell them this? Will y'all say this with me? Say, that is one. Come on, say it like you mean it. That is one good-looking preacher. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now, I I feel good. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Now, I feel good. I feel at home now. I feel welcomed. (laughs) Hallelujah. Acts 17, I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. If you were there, would you say Jesus is better? better. All right, let's read together. Then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things that you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands. I'm going to say that again because we didn't get it. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord and hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us. I'm going to give you that again because you missed it. He is not far from each one of us. Verse 28, say it with me, Pentecostal people. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Let's pray together and we're going to work this out. Y'all ready? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this church. I thank you for healing Pastor Don. And I thank you for everything you've already done. Holy Ghost, we give you these next few moments to come and do whatever you want to do. I believe you to be a tremendous teacher and preacher. And I'm asking that you do it through me tonight. In the powerful name of Jesus, we receive all you have for us. Amen. Amen. 
And amen. Uh, as I begin to look back on this past Sunday, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in because I got a lot of work to do. Y'all ready? As I look back on this past Sunday, I tuned in and I watched our pastor preach the message that he preached Sunday. Was anybody here Sunday? Wave at me if you were here Sunday. Shame on you if you're not waving. Amen. And he began to preach a message that I was not in the room, come on, but I was watching it on my phone. And I don't know what it felt like in here, but as I began to listen to what the man of God said, I felt joy stirring up in my body when he began to give us an illustration of a sacrificial lamb that's what he did we all here come on he brought the lamb into the building and pastor Don began to release some words that I just couldn't get out of my spirit and it caused me to weep and it caused me to be overjoyed with peace and come on rest is what I started to find and here's why because our pastor I'm just going to backtrack to Sunday y'all stay with me for all you rebels that weren't here but on Sunday he had a a lamb and he took that lamb and he started teaching us about how that lamb would be inspected to make sure that it was a perfect and spotless lamb and then he told us that they would they would watch over this lamb for four days so that they could determine that this thing was a perfect sacrifice and he he, he was talking about how they would take that lamb and they would take it to a priest and the priest would examine the lamb do y'all remember what i'm talking about y'all better wake up this is gonna get good tonight they would examine the lamb and what our pastor said was this and this is what really stirred my spirit up he said that when the priest would get the lamb he would examine the lamb and not the sinner that was giving the lamb Ah, it's, quite, it's too quiet in here because I think we miss it. He said that they would examine the lamb. And I want you to understand that there has been a sacrificial lamb that has taken your place. And that when God was looking at that lamb, he looked down at Jesus on the cross and knew that he was perfect and spotless and holy. And he was the substitute for you and I. That's a big deal. Now, can I tell you something? I haven't always known him as that lamb. I've not always known him as that sacrificial lamb. And I want you to know I've been in church for quite some time. And I want you to know I've been serving in church. But even in the times that I was in church, I didn't know him as that lamb. And when I saw this story in the book of Acts, I began to see a lot of my story in it. So if you'll go with me, I just want to go on a journey tonight, a little bit of backtrack of what I've been through. Because I believe that there are a lot of people in churches that we don't know him as that lamb. We know of him and we talk about him and we hear other people talk about him, but we don't really know him as that lamb and Paul shows up to the men in Athens and he says that I can see that you're doing all these religious things and I can see all these objects that you're worshiping and I perceive that you are very religious and I can see all this stuff you're doing but there is an altar with this inscription that says to the unknown God so what Paul says is I want to proclaim to you a God that you worship that you do not know so my question to you is, is it possible for somebody in this room to worship a God that they don't know? Is it possible for you to worship a God that you don't know? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the answer to that is yes. And I'm 100% convinced you can do it because I did it for a very long time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Could you be worshiping a God that you do, don't, do not know? Well, we'll get into it and find out and see if, if this relates to you. And I want you to know I'm not here to make you feel bad and I'm not talking down to you and I'm sure not trying to stomp on your toes. That's not my approach. I just want you free. I want you free for real because I am convinced that who the sun sets free is truly free indeed. And I want you to be free. Paul begins to walk through Athens and he sees all these objects that these men are worshiping. But it's interesting to me that even though they were worshipers and even though they had religious activity, they still had emptiness in their life. Ah, there was still something that didn't quite feel right. There was still this unfulfillment in their life. How do you know that? Well, if, if it wasn't true, why would they have an altar that was given to an unknown God? Because if they were willing to worship a God they didn't know, that means the objects they were worshiping wouldn't producing enough. Now, I wonder, this is where it's going to get a little bit sticky. 
I wonder if there's anybody in the room that would be honest enough to go, I know what it feels like to go through the religious rituals of church. And I know what it feels like to go to the prayer meeting. And I know what it feels like to go to the Bible study. And I know what it feels like to do my daily devotions. And I get around my brothers and sisters in Christ and everybody seems to be free. And everybody seems to be shouting breakthrough. And everybody's faith is doing good in their life. But I deep down don't really feel that way I feel like I'm missing something oh it's quiet in this church I thought it would be I wonder if you ever went through all the motions of what you knew was the right thing to do and everybody's shouting freedom and everybody's declaring how good God is oh but if we were to take you off to the side and ask you do you feel like you are fulfilled in Jesus you would go you know what I have doubts uh, you know what? I, I really deal with insecurities and I really have fears in my life. This is what really happens, but I don't want nobody to know that. So when I come to church on Sunday, I just put on my mask so that you don't know what I'm going through because I don't want you to know that I doubt. Because if I can just keep pretending, uh, okay, come on, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. If I can just keep pretending, then one day I will receive my breakthrough just like my brothers and sisters seem to have found it. And we put on this act and we put on this show, but at the end of the day, it is all full of emptiness. Now, I'm not trying to call you out, but I want you to think about something. If you're in this room tonight and you've ever felt that way, could it be possible? that we worship a God that we do not know. Could it be possible? And as I begin to examine my life and I started to look back on my journey, I know that I served a God that I didn't know. I want you to know that I was in church for 30 plus years. I didn't know him. I want you to know I was serving in church for 10 years and I didn't know him. Can I tell you that I was teaching for five years and I did not know him? Ooh. I want you to know that I didn't really know him. And so when I begin to find Christ in the right way and I begin to put my trust in him 100% and the Holy Spirit began to reveal things to me about him that I never knew before, I started to ask questions. I had a lot of questions because I didn't understand why did I not know him and how did I misunderstand him so bad? What was it that caused me to miss Jesus all those years when I was actually going through the religious activities? Why is it that I missed him? And I started to think back at my childhood because, listen, I was born and raised in church. Church was all I ever knew. I was made to go whether I wanted to or not. Okay, I was that kid. So I went back to my childhood, and I wish that I could share with you this great salvation story because many of you have powerful salvation stories, and, and you can remember the time that you received the life of Christ, and you can remember the time that he picked you up out of your mess. Does anybody in the room remember that? Does anybody ever hold on to that time when it felt like there was no way, but then you found Jesus and he made a way, and everything started to change for you? Anybody remember that time? I love hearing those stories. They're very powerful, and they motivate me to keep going forward but the truth is church I don't have that story you say when did you get saved and I, I really don't like when people ask me that because I don't know the answer to it if I can be honest because somewhere between the age of nine and 12 years old I got saved about 52 times a year mm -hmm. y'all laughing at me but we got adults in here that still okay look I'm not gonna touch that one 52 times a year from those three years, 9 to 12, I got saved every Sunday, and there was the occasional midweek, okay, when I needed that courtesy salvation, amen. So I was probably getting saved about 60 times a year for three years, but I don't know that actual moment. But how many of you understand that salvation is a very precious gift? It's a very precious gift. Now, I don't remember my salvation moment, but what I do remember is when I did receive that precious baptism in what we call the Holy Ghost. Now, I do remember that moment, and it's always stuck with me. Now, I don't know why I, I never forgot it, but I have it. September of 1999. Come on. I was only 12 years old, but when the man of God laid his hand on me, I began to speak in another tongue. It's just what happened. And you go, well, I don't know about that. Yeah, well, I didn't either. I was only 12 years old. Think about it. How precious of a gift. 
How powerful of a gift that he would allow a child to receive salvation or that he would allow a child to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's a big deal. But as I begin to think about that, how could I have known as a child what any of that stuff really meant? How could I really know what it meant to be saved uh, by grace? How could I know that? How could I know what it meant to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? Now, you can go, oh, you were that guy, so you were baptized uh, in the Spirit at a young age, so you spent your teenage years laying hands on people and prophesying. Yeah, wrong. <laughs> Leave me out there like that. Y'all was rebellious teenagers, too. It didn't happen that way for me. As a matter of fact, I know that I received the gift, but I did not pick it back up until my young adult age. But I begin to question, why would God give me these precious gifts when I don't understand nothing about them? So then I begin to ask myself this question. Could it be possible that you and I as adults could have gifts that are powerful that we don't know anything about? Huh? Because obviously he doesn't release these gifts based off of our maturity levels. Come on. He gave me that gift at 12 years old, but I didn't know what it meant. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't really know how to use it. So here's what I've come to declare to you tonight. I want you to know that God has deposited something in your life that is greater than what you realize. I want you to know that there are things in your life that you don't know that you carry, but God knows you have it because he gave it to you when you were still in your mother's womb. Some of you are carrying words and prophetic anointings that you don't know about. Hallelujah. So I received those gifts at a young age. And I want you to know that because of me thinking like that, I begin to think, could it be possible, Clay, that I have something now and I don't realize how good it is? Maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe there's something in this journey that I don't realize how good this really is because I was in church a long time and doing all the right things as long as I possibly could, but there was something on the inside of me that was empty. It's quiet in here, and that's okay, but I believe some of you have been to church for a while, and you feel empty. Paul shows up to these men in Athens and he begins to introduce to them the unknown God. And I love how Paul just boldly begins to preach to them. He says, I see all these objects, but I also see this altar that has been uh, described to the unknown God. Now, let me tell you something about why that's so powerful. Because if you understand an altar, can I teach a minute? If you understand an altar, an altar is where you would offer your sacrifice. An altar is where your sacrifice would go. So if I had an altar, I want you to know something. I had an altar in my life that I was praying to, that I was believing in. But what I didn't realize is I had the wrong sacrifice on my altar. Ah, church, what I began to realize was I was putting myself on my altar because I didn't know him as my sacrificial lamb. Ooh, it's quiet in here, but I'm going to preach this thing anyway because I want you to understand that I begin to realize that I had the wrong thing on my altar. It wasn't the lamb. It was Stephen Pierce that was on my altar. I was sacrificing myself. And can I tell you what happened in my life when I just continuously was sacrificing myself? I was living in fear. I was living in doubt. I was living unrestful. I was battling insecurities. And I just kept believing that God was going to set me free. But I didn't realize that my altar was wrong. I had the wrong person on the altar. And then Paul shows up in Athens and he begins to preach. And, and this is where I saw my story in this. So if I get a little carried away, y'all just stay with me. I'm one of them hyper type preachers. Come on. But I begin to see Paul representing the Holy Spirit in my life because when he shows up to the men of Athens and he begins to preach to them a God that they did not know, it was the same way that the Holy Ghost preached him to me. Can I give you some examples? When Paul shows up and he says this, he says, I perceive that, that in all things that you are very religious. Can I tell you that's the first thing the Holy Spirit spoke to me? Stephen, all this stuff is nice, but I perceive that you are very religious. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't like it. I actually didn't like it at all because I was pointing my finger at people and calling them religious. 
I wasn't religious, you're religious. Why was I not religious? Well, let me tell you why I wasn't religious. Because I went to a charismatic church. And as long as I was in a charismatic church and we jump and we shout and we scream and we run, that means I'm not in a religious box like you. And even though I was doing all those things, I still had myself on my altar. Paul shows up and he says, I, I perceive that you are very religious. That's the very first word that was spoken to me. But he says, listen, I want to preach to you a God that you do not know. And I want you to hear my testimony. I'm just sharing my testimony now. Y'all take a breath. It's okay. Relax. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And this is what he said. He said, I want to proclaim to you a God that you are worshiping that you don't know. And he says something that sounds real familiar. He said, it's God who made the whole world and everything in it. <laughs> Why does that matter? Because when the Holy Ghost began to preach Jesus to me, he preached him bigger than I had ever heard him preach before. I said he preaches him real big. Here's what I want you to understand. The God that you and I serve is bigger than what you realize. I said he's bigger. He's bigger than your sickness. He's bigger than your disease. He's bigger than your struggle. He's bigger than your doubts and he's bigger than your fears. I want you to know the God that we serve, he is bigger. Holy Ghost begin to preach him to me in a bigger way. Oh, let me add this one while I'm at it because I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kick it. Here we go. Y'all ready? He's also bigger than the devil in your life. Some of y'all need to hear that because you can go to most pulpits around here and they'll preach to you the strength of an enemy. And they want you to know how strong the devil is. And his enemy this and devil that. And you better watch out for this. But I want you to know what I preach. I preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, I preach my God real big. I preach a wee little devil and a real great big God. That's what I preach. And if I preach him too big, I'll just take it up with him one day. But I want you to understand that he is big. And I, what I begin to realize is he was bigger than what my faith was allowing him to be. He was bigger. And see, I had limited him to certain activities because I would just beg him to do things for me, not realizing that he had already provided it for me. And so he was bigger. And I began to realize this, that he was God all by himself. He didn't need me. He didn't need my help. He was God all by himself. And then Paul says this. He says, listen, he doesn't dwell in temples made with men, nor is he worshiped with the hands of men. Now that messed with me right there. That messed with me right there. But I want you to know the Holy Spirit began to deal with me in that. He began to deal with me because when I used to believe, are y'all ready? When I didn't know him, can, let me say it that way. When I didn't really know him, I thought that what God was going to give me was based on the intensity of my worship. Mm -hmm. I thought that if I could build something big enough for him or something extravagant enough for him or if I could work up enough worship that he would receive me or he would give me what I'm asking for or he would give me what I need. Don't you think it's interesting that Paul shows up to a religious crowd and he basically says this, if you think you have anything to offer him, you don't know him. Y'all got to catch it. Y'all got to catch it. Because he says that he is the God of the creator of all the world and everything in it. And he gave everything breath. And he don't even need to be worshipped by your hand. So if you think that you have something to offer this God, you do not know who he is. See, I needed this word. I needed somebody to share this word for me because that's exactly where I was at. And I believed that if I could pray intensely and I could worship intensely, that he would move on my behalf. And, and then I began to ask this question, why do I feel that way? Well, I'll tell you why I felt that way. I can tell you exactly why. Because I heard these words in church. I don't know, maybe you've heard it before. But there is a miracle in your shout. 
Oh, it's quiet in here. There's a miracle in your shout. And if you shout, God will provide a miracle for you. Or maybe you've heard this one. There's a breakthrough in your praise. And if you'll just praise him real hard, there's a breakthrough on the other side. You ever heard that before? See, I heard that before. Or maybe you heard that there is victory in your song. You ever heard that? And it make you sing louder. And it make you praise harder. Make you cry more intensely. But I want you to know something. You know what I found out? I found out none of that was in my worship. I want you to know none of that was in my worship. If you want to know where a miracle is, I'll tell you where it is. Your miracle was on the back of Jesus when he took that stripe. Hallelujah. The Bible said that it was by his stripe that you are healed, not your shout. Oh, I'm not done yet. You want me to tell you your breakthrough is? You need a breakthrough? Anybody in the room need a breakthrough? I'll tell you where that thing is. Your breakthrough is in the blood of Jesus. I want you to know your breakthrough is flowing down the cross that was on Calvary's hill. That's where your breakthrough is. And I want you to know that your victory is in Jesus. Your breakthrough written on the other side of your shout or your praise. There's nothing you can do to worship him enough to make him move on your behalf. What worship? Oh, let me set you free because some of y'all are confused. Because you're going, are you saying we don't need to worship? That's not what I'm saying at all. That would be silly. Worship is our response to what Jesus has already provided for us. Worship is my thankfulness that says I am convinced that Jesus is enough. That's what worship is. Ooh, I done got in a little deep. Can I just go in a little further? I feel some of you kicking, so I might as well go on in. I'm going to go a little bit further. Because before I knew him, I thought that my worship would draw the presence in. Ooh -wee. I thought that my worship would draw it in if, if I could say the right things or maybe if I could use a spiritual gift that it would draw the presence in. But I want you to hear what Paul said. He doesn't dwell in temples made with men. What does that mean? He only dwells in temples that only the creator could create. Guess what? Good news. That's you and me. I want you to know that the presence of God is in the new covenant temple, which is me and it's you. We are the carriers of the presence of God. And then I read in Genesis 28 when Jacob says this. Maybe you've heard it before, so you don't have to go there. But Jacob said that truly the presence of the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Why do I say that to you? Because wouldn't it be a shame if we lived our life in the presence of God and didn't know it? Wouldn't it be a shame if God was with you everywhere you went and you didn't know it? Wouldn't it be a shame if there was benefits to your life such as rest and such as joy and peace and righteousness, but we missed it because we thought we had to worship to get it? Oh, it's quiet in here. I'm going to go ahead and make this statement. I'm going to move on because some of y'all mad at me. The presence of God is not your reward for worship. Let me set you free because y'all are tight. But what worship does is it makes you more aware of the presence that has always been there. Because it shifts your focus. Come on, that's exactly why we fast. That's exactly why we pray. Because it shifts our focus and it puts our mind on a God that is bigger than our problem. Hallelujah. Now, I didn't always know him like this for a long time I didn't know him this way but then Paul shows up in Athens and starts to talk about a God that you're worshiping that you don't know and I'm like hey wait a minute that sounds like something I did for a long time but then in Philippians 3 you don't have to go there because most of you are familiar with this but I do encourage you to study it on your own time Philippians 3 verse number 10 Paul talks about knowing him he talks about knowing him, and he talks about three things that we need to know. And the first thing that he says that we need to know is him. You need to know him. The second thing is we need to know the power of his resurrection. Yeah, that gives me chills too. The power of his resurrection. How many of you know what we're celebrating this weekend? Oh, that's right. We're going to celebrate resurrection weekend. I want you to know that the resurrection life is greater. I want you to know it's greater than revival. 
when you get a hold of the resurrection life, it will begin to transform your life. And then he says this. He says, and we need to know the fellowships of his sufferings, conforming, y'all get this, to his death. We need to get the fellowships of his suffering conforming to his death. Y'all got that? Because here's what I need you to understand. I knew him for a long time, but I did not conform to his death. See, now a lot of us don't even know what that means. Can I teach you for a second? Because in the chapter before, in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible tells us that Jesus humbled himself. And he became obedient unto the point of what? Death. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. What does that mean? That means that the death of Jesus is tied up into his obedience. Okay, let me help you. So when we conform to his death, what we are conforming to is his obedience. Am I teaching okay? We got to get this. Because here's what I begin to find out about myself. I was conforming. I was conforming to church. I was conforming to religious activity. I was conforming to a whole lot of other things that I thought was the right thing. I was conforming. But what I realized was I was not conforming to the obedience of Christ. I was trying more so to conform to my own obedience. It's quiet in this church. I'm going to set you free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Y'all need to get ready to shout. Watch this. Watch this. So what I began to find out about Stephen Pierce, that's me, was that I was more conforming to disobedience. Okay? So disobedience, let me teach for just a minute and I'm going to let y'all go. Disobedience represents Adam. Adam. Now what I found out about me was I was conforming to the disobedience of Adam. And I can prove it to you. Y'all ready? In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth, that it was finished. Somebody shout, it was finished. And then he puts a garden right in the middle of a finished work. He puts a garden right in the middle of a finished work. He creates a man in his own image, and he tells him to keep the garden. Y'all familiar with the story? But the Bible says that the serpent comes and tells Adam, if you want to be like God, you need to do what he told you not to do. So when Adam did what he wasn't supposed to do, watch this, he was more focused on his work than he was the work of God. Here we go. So because Adam was more focused on his disobedience, the Bible says that when the voice of God came walking through the garden, that God was saying, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I hid myself. So how do I know that I conform to Adam? Because my whole entire Christianity journey, I was hiding from God. I was hiding from him because of my disobedience. And I felt like he didn't want no part of me and he didn't want nothing to do with me because he was mad at me. And since he was mad at me, I was hiding myself even though he was still calling for me and even though he was still looking for me. See, it's interesting to me that the very first question in the Bible is, Adam, where are you? But then when we get to the New Testament, the very first question that you find is, where is this king of the Jews? Because there was a baby that was wrapped in swaddling clothing, and he was laying in a manger. Oh, this is real good. Y'all got to catch this. When God asked Adam, where are you? He didn't ask Adam where he was because physically he didn't know. How many of you understand he's an all-knowing God? He knew exactly where Adam was. What God was looking for was his image. And when he got to the garden, he didn't see his image. But I want you to know that when that baby showed up in that manger, y'all better listen to me, the image that God had been looking for has shown back up on the earth in the form of a baby. And I want you to know that his name is Jesus. And I want you to know that he was in a manger on purpose. Why? Because the manger represents the feeding trough. 
So Adam ate something and messed up and got us in a bunch of problems. But I want you to know that God sent the perfect lamb and put him in a manger. And then he sent the shepherds that represent the pastors. He sent the shepherds to the manger so that the pastors can teach the flock, this is what we need to be eating on. If you eat of the lamb, it will change your life. If we can give you a steady diet of the finished work of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial work, it will will transform your life it's quiet in here and I think this is why because some of y'all were going wait a minute are you saying that we can just sin and it doesn't matter think about how silly that question is because what good in your life will sin produce if Jesus said, I want to give you life and give it to you more abundant, but sinful habits produce bad things that happen and consequences in your life, why do you think that would mean that it's just okay? But what I do think we need to change, church, and this is a, a message I'm going to thunder out with boldness because I believe that God's given me a microphone in this season to preach it to you, is that even in the time of your mistake, I'm not going to say if you mess up, I'm going to say when, because the truth is everybody in this room has fallen short and everybody in this room is going to make mistakes but in the time of your trouble and in the time of your fall I want you to run to God and not run away from him <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah I'm getting ready to close here but I want you to think about the shift in the church if we can get people to stop running from God because for the longest time, I ran from him because I didn't know him. And you know what I didn't know about him? I didn't know that he was for me. I didn't know that he loved me unconditionally. I didn't know that he was going to be there for me no matter what. I didn't know that he was calling for me when I was hiding. See, that's what I didn't know. And I believe there are many people in this room under the sound of my voice. You've been on the run, and you've been running from God because you think he's mad. And you've been running from him because you know that you've messed up and you've made mistakes. But I'm telling you, God brought you to War Hill, Dawsonville on a Wednesday night so you can listen to me tell you it's time for you to, it is time for you to run to him and stop running from him he's calling for you he's calling for you so here's my question is it possible that you could be worshiping a God that you don't know could your doubts and your fears and your insecurities and your mistakes simply be because you don't know him you don't understand unconditional love because you've never been given unconditional love See, what we preach, Lord, I'm in trouble anyway, so let me do it. What we tell you is to love God, right? You got to love him with all your heart and all your strength. But you will never love him until you know how much he loves you. That's what John said. I love him because he first loved me. And when you realize how much he loves you, it changes and shifts the way that you think. It transforms your life because your mind begins to change. Isn't that what Paul says? It's to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we've got to change our mind and realize that God is 100% for you. Hallelujah. Do me a favor. Everybody stand with me across the room. I want you to know he's for you. He's not against you. Hallelujah. Just as the heart of this house, because we believe in winning souls. I believe in winning souls. I believe there's a great harvest coming. I believe that there's a shift coming where we're going to be running to God in the time of trouble. And you don't have to come to church and, well, maybe I'll get involved. Maybe I won't. I don't know. I've had a bad week and I don't know if God will accept me. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You know what's wrong with us? We don't believe it. That's what I tell everybody all the time. The news is so good, it's hard for us to believe. It's the good news. Remember, we used to say this in Canton all the time. If it seems too good to be true, it must be the gospel. It's the good news. It's a God that's chasing you down. It's a God that loves you with everything in him. Would you do me a favor with every head bowed and every eye closed across this room? 
If you're in this room tonight, and I know you're here, listen, don't be shy. Because in no way, shape, or form am I going to embarrass you. But if you say, preacher, I want to, I want to receive this life of Christ. And I want to make that decision to make Jesus the Lord of my life. If you've never made that decision, and you know tonight needs to be your night, would you just sit, slip, simply slip up your hand just so I know who I'm praying with? Anybody in the room, don't miss it. I see you, sir. Congratulations. That's a big day for you. Anybody else? Come on, don't miss this. Don't miss it. Anybody else in the room? We got one, and that's enough for heaven to rejoice. Amen? Anybody else? Anybody else? All you got to do is slip a hand up just so I know who I'm praying with. That's all you have to do. I see you, sir. I see you. I see you. I see you. Amen. Amen. War here, would y'all pray with me? Uh, sir, I want you to just say this prayer with me, but I, we're all going to pray it with you together. Heavenly Father, I admit that I need a Savior. And I believe that Jesus Christ is that Savior. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And from this moment forward, I receive the life of Christ. Amen. Amen. Come on, you better put your hands together like you mean it. That's a soul in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Anybody receive this word tonight? Did anybody receive? I want to know, did you receive it? Let me, let me say it this way, because church people always support you because y'all are so loving. Does anybody say that was for me? I needed to hear that. Okay, good. That's enough confirmation. for It just makes me feel right, okay? It's okay. Encourage your pastor to know he's hearing from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Here's what I'm going to do. I just want to say a prayer because I believe there are people in here that need to know God is bigger than what you realize. He's bigger. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you don't mind, if you don't want to do it, don't do it because I never wanted to do it when the preacher used to do this. But if you would take somebody's hand, I just want to say a prayer, and we're going, to, we're going to dismiss. We're going to do a dismissal prayer, but before we leave, I just want us to pray together. Can we do that? Can we just pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night. God, I thank you for the words that were released tonight in this house, that we as your children no longer have to run from you. But God, I believe that there is a shifting coming in the house of God, that we are, the saints are beginning to turn back and run to you. And Lord, I'm so thankful for your grace and your mercy and your truth that is available to us. And God, I thank you for your love that has pulled us out of the mess. And Lord, I speak to every condemnation in this room that causes children to run and hide. And I tell you that you have no place, no authority. And I cast you down at the foot of the cross and I plead the blood of Jesus over it. And I want you to hear the word of the Lord tonight that declares you have been made innocent. You have been found not guilty. I want you to know God loves you. God embraces you. He is for you and he is not against you. Father, I thank you for every person that's in this room. And Lord, I pray that you would continue Continue to speak to us throughout the week. Holy Ghost, have your way. Lord, I pray for a stirring right now. Ah, Lord, I pray that the, the power of the Holy Ghost would move across this room and begin to stir up the spirits of every person in here. And Lord, I pray that as we go our way, that you would be with us and continue to show us fresh new revelation. Holy Ghost, we give you permission to show us things and to speak to us, Lord, when we need to do things different. Lord, if we have religion on us, I pray that you would reveal Reveal it to us and cast it down. And may we become lovers of God and not lovers of religion. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the movement. I thank you, God, for this grace, Father, that is touching the heart of the church. We thank you for it. Father, I pray for every person in this room. God, I'm asking that you would just rain down blessing and favor over every person. Father, I pray for that hedge of protection as we go tonight. And Lord, I pray that we would take this word and that we would seal it in our heart, that we would receive the love of Jesus. We thank you for everything you've done tonight. Keep us safe in the, as we go. In the powerful and the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Wonderful, wonderful message, amen. Just want to remind everybody, next Wednesday, April 3rd, we will not be in the building. 
We'll be meeting at Pine Valley at the park, okay, for picking in the park. So family, friends, we're meeting there 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., so no service in the building, but we will all be meeting at Pine Valley. Bless you all. Amen.